Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. This is Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel, and uh, our topic today is the 19th century, uh, and it still lives. It lives in Oahu right now. It lives in Oahu Cemetery right now. Uh, <laughs> and the fellow who is the curator of uh, public programs, uh, such as the Poo Poo Dinner, which is organized, uh, I guess, on an annual basis, but the it repeats itself a number of times in that year, is Mike Smola. Welcome to the show, Mike. Aloha. Thanks for having me, Jay. This is a fabulous show. I've been to it a number of times. Uh, and in a word, uh, what happens is, uh, as, a, as a guest of the show, after you have your poo-poos, um, you wander through Oahu Cemetery, and you sit under canopies, and you watch actors uh, depict characters out of the development of Hawaii in the 19th century who are buried right there where they are sitting in Oahu Cemetery. What a brilliant idea to bring it home to you, to put you in that community, to put you in the 19th century, to be surrounded with the events that shaped our state. That was your idea, Mike, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, myself and uh, Dr. Tom Woods, who's our former executive director at Hawaii Mission Houses, um, uh, put decided to do this starting about 11 years ago, actually. And your role these days uh, is to make it happen and make it accurate and to research what was happening with each one of these people in the cemetery that we celebrate, and then to write a script for the actor to act. This is, um, this is an incredible experience. Uh, how do you like your work, Mike? Oh, I love my work. I mean, I, Every time we pick a new theme, I get to research some something different, and I get to research some different people, um, which is really neat uh, for me. Kind of gets me out of my my sort of uh, Hawaiian mission houses mode, and you know, just nineteenth century missionary stuff allows me to explore other areas of Hawaiian history. Um, so yeah, it's it's super neat researching each person, uh, going through the the uh, the primary document research. Uh, but I do send that off to a scriptwriter. I hire a scriptwriter to do that for us. Hmm. So what, what kind of materials do you look at in terms of, um, you know, finding the facts and developing, you know, biological information about each of the people that are celebrated? Yeah, so I, um, I usually look at if there is journals in existence, letters uh, written by them and to them. I look at uh, newspaper stories of the time period. And if I'm lucky, I get a chance to have to look at their private papers, uh, which are sometimes held in different uh, different archives, including the Hawaii Mission House's archive. Uh, so that's the type of stuff I'm usually looking at um, as far as primary document research. Mm. And you, you talked about themes, and I always always found your choice of themes very interesting because it was always a sort of a different perspective about the period, about the people who lived in the period, about the kinds of things they did. So can you give us some examples of the themes you've selected? I mean, not only this year, but in, in recent years and why? Right, so this past year, our theme was Hawaii 1822, uh, cause we had a lot of bicentennials going on to celebrate the arrival of Tahitian Christian missionaries here in Hawaii, uh, the uh, first printing in Olelo, Hawaii, uh, and as, as well as begins kind of the beginnings of Bible translation work and things like that. Uh, we've also done uh, environmental history. We had a show a few years ago called Footprints on the Land uh, about uh, different people involved in various aspects of the uh, environmental movement, and, you know, environmental history here in the islands. Uh, we've done public and government service. We've done medicine. Uh, we've done uh, education. We've done the arts. Uh, so we, we try to touch on a lot of different aspects. Um, also makes the show fresh every year. Absolutely. And it is fresh every year. By the way, what, what qualifies you to do this research, to do this analysis, to select these themes uh, and these particular people out of Oahu Cemetery? Mm -hmm. So I, um, I have a bachelor's degree in history uh, from Michigan State University. I also have a graduate certification in museum studies also from Michigan State. Um, and I've been here at the Mission Houses 14 years now, uh, this August 1st. Uh, and I've been the curator of programs for about 11 of those years now. Mm, that would uh, be so, the, the entire period of the Mission House uh, poo poo dinner. Then, that's correct. <laughs> yep. Uh, so it's. Uh, I, I mean, I've been doing a lot of my own research for a number of years. 
Um, I, and it's really interesting being able to find all that stuff and having the knowledge of where to look is a really important aspect of that. Well, I, I wanted to um, look, look over this from the, from the say the 50,000 foot level and see what it means in you know, the year 20, 2022 to look back at not only the 19th century, but the early 19th century. Uh, there, of course, there are points of interest and appeal uh, simply on the basis of the history, but it goes beyond that. I mean, you're, you're, you're sitting next to a grave of some person who lived and you're looking at an actor who is trying really hard and really well to depict the life of that person. And it draws you in like, like Bruce through the keyhole <laughs> into a nostalgic experience where you can see you know, the outlines of all the details. And so, um, so aside, and that's very historically, what do you want to call it? Ex historically connecting. It connects you, this experience to go through the Mission House Museum, Mission Houses Museum program connects you with the history of Hawaii. Maybe as you've never been connected before, actually. A lot of people I'm sure who come to the program don't know that much about Hawaiian history in the 19th century, especially the early 19th century, and they are sponges. They mm -hmm. learn about this. And how do I know that? Because I always attend your Q&A session. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so it, then it goes beyond that because you, you're touching points that um, that reflect the development of Hawaii uh, as, as, as a place where the missionaries came, uh, as a place where the monarchy learned from them and where the, where the whole state grew. And of course, as I have learned from watching your programs, the state of Hawaii, the territory of Hawaii, the, the kingdom of Hawaii grew in astronomical steps in the 19th century. And you capture that. It's actually much more, much more accelerated uh, than we thought, right? Absolutely. I mean, one of the neat things about this, uh, this program, our, our Cemetery Poo Poo Theater program, is that um, we kind of get a lens through individual eyes um, into the things going on. A lot of people do know the sort of broad strokes of Hawaiian history and and some of the eras that we depict and, and talk about. Um, but I think getting the lens from a single person's perspective um, is something that allows us to illuminate a lot of detail and a lot of nuance in that history that you might not get from uh, an academic article um, or some other source uh, about history. And I think, uh, and that also allows us to depict multiple perspectives uh, around the same events or the same time period as well. And I think, and I think, being in the cemetery is a is a unique part of the experience. I mean, in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, uh, par cemeteries were kind of the public parks of the period, and people would go and visit their their family members, and you know, have picnics there and talk about family stories. And that is, uh, it, it's the same kind of idea, except on a more museum professional level, I guess. You know, it's funny you say that. I was I was going to. Uh and tell you that I remember that particular phenomenon from first time I attended the program. And when my wife and I uh, came to the program a few weeks ago, uh, we, we were really charmed to see that there were people, attendees, who were out in the cemetery uh, having their dinner by the gravestone. And it mm -hmm. reminded, me, <laughs> reminded me of exactly what you were talking about. It's a place for a picnic. It's a place to celebrate. It's a place to enjoy, you know, your ancestors and, and, and Hawaiian history. Uh, and it was happening even today. It's, it's infectious is what it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's really neat. And I, I've noticed that um, here in Hawaii that people still do that sort of thing. Um, absolutely. And I think that's something that's super neat also is to be able to tap into that aspect of local culture here and, uh, and, and bring it in a different way while still Kind of getting at that same idea uh, of the picnic in the in the cemetery. Yeah. So, how do you choose the people for each production? I mean, there you know the cemetery is filled with people, um, and there are what I would say hundreds or thousands there. A lot of those names are very familiar to us because they were part of Hawaii history. 
Uh, they were part of the development of the monarchy uh, and the state later. Um, and they, uh, they count, they all count. So here you're, you're, you have a wealth of possibilities. How do you select the ones that you are going to dwell on? Right, so the, the first part of that is the theme. Right, and then who is involved with that theme that's buried at the Wahoo Cemetery? Um, the other thing I get drawn to a lot of times is undertold stories, and so or stories that are not very well known. And so, um, if I can find someone that has, I think that has an undertold or never told story or, or untold story, um, I get drawn to that as well. Um, so, picking those folks is really centered around the theme, and then who had the biggest impact. Um, on that theme, or who, uh, once I start the basic research on it, who has a really interesting story? Sometimes you come across a story that um, is so amazing, it's like, I, can, I can't not tell this. Um, <laughs> so, you know, this is a story that everyone should, should really know about. <laughs> and so um, the other part of that is determining if there's enough research material uh, to, to develop one of these 20 minute monologues. Um, and see if there's enough, if there's a there there. Because um, sometimes you find someone who's really neat um, or is super involved in the theme, but there's not enough extant research material to really build a, a 20 minute script around. Yeah. Um, okay. So so that's that's really how we get, get down. The other part I have to take into account is for the live program at Oahu Cemetery is how close the graves are together uh, so that we make sure that there isn't sound bleed between the actors and and things like that. So uh, that's kind of the basic process of how to whittle it down to the five people we do every year. Yeah, they're not that close together and, and the, the attendees uh, have to walk a bit or take a, a golf cart uh, as, mm -hmm. as necessary from one to the other. And, and while you're walking, that's still another experience because you know, you're looking at the graves, you're feeling you know, the, the community, if you will, of the cemetery. And so you get to know the nature of this cemetery, why this cemetery is different, and why it's a kind of treasure and to anyone who cares uh, about history in, in Oahu, in, in Hawaii. Um, I was going to ask you, too, uh, how, oh, and it's really a kick, by the way, to see the person. It's always the same. The person has his back to the audience and is situated on a chair. Um, right next to the gravestone, so you can see the gravestone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of, you know, what is this going to be like? Who is this person? Why do I care about this person? And, and in each case, uh, I notice that you include points of reference. So you know, it's never in a vacuum. You always know something about the progeny, the legacy of the individual uh, who who is talking to you, and so you can connect that up to your own perhaps limited understanding of uh, 19th century history. Um, but I was going to ask you this, um, you know, can you give us some examples of some of the characters that you portrayed this year, for example, uh, with interesting <clears throat> stories? Uh, I, one of the ones that I was particularly drawn to this year was the story of Tau'a, uh, the Tahitian Christian teacher who is uh, largely responsible for the conversion of Queen Keopuolani to Christianity. Um, and he was kind of her personal chaplain and Christian teacher. Um, the role of the Tahitian Christians here in Hawaii um, is something that's just come to, you know, kind of been pushed to the forefront in the last five to 10 years in the academic literature and the important role of indigenous peoples from other places um, and their place and role here in Hawaiian histories. I think that's something that's just coming to light, something that's certainly undertold. And I think it's important to bring those stories to light as well. Um, that was one of my favorite ones. Uh, Reverend William Ellis is a- Before you go further to Reverend yeah. William Ellison, I, I just want to say that was my favorite one also. Uh, mm -hmm. As I recall, a Native Hawaiian actor played that role. Uh, uh, he's Samoan by background, but Samoan, yeah, okay. he, he is Polynesian, yes. He was, he was great. He was so captivating and relating and to the audience. I just loved listening to him. Um, mm -hmm. And so much so that I, I went up to him afterward and he, as he reseated himself for the next rotation of, of the audience, and uh, I went over to him and I and I complimented him. I told him how great he was, and uh, it really it it, uh, it brightened him up for me to tell him that. I always do that, you know. When they're really good, I go and talk to them, 
Uh, I wanted oh, to know how the, how the audience feels about it. <laughs> right. Yeah, Albert Welligatoni is the actor who portrayed Tawa for us, for us this year. And uh, this is his fourth or fifth portrayal, different portrayal he's done for us over the years. Um, he's an amazing actor and a wonderful person to work with. Yeah. So I, I like them all, though. I, I, and I, I sure like the stories. And the stories are always dis disparate. You know, There's, they're not the same kinds of people necessarily, but they may mm -hmm. know each other. And I can recall one one year you really, you really captivated me because you had one member one one decedent on one side the cemetery and he was talking about his business relationship with another guy who was buried mm -hmm. in the far side of the cemetery and he was saying things like that bugger he cheated me he took my money <laughs> i i sued him and he sued me and we hated each other okay and then uh, you walk a few feet to the other side of the cemetery and you talk to that very same guy that he was talking about mm -hmm. and he, yeah, that bugger on the other side of the cemetery, he cheated me and we had litigation and he was all wrong. It was really, really interesting to see them talk about each other. I thought that was brilliant. And so the, the connection is not necessarily with iconic things that you may know about you know, from your life today in Hawaii. Uh, it's iconic things between the individuals who are buried right there in the cemetery. Anyway, um, you, you, you were going to talk about Ellison now. Yeah, so I mean, but I think that's a really important thing is that we have, we have uh, you know, depending upon the theme, some of these people knew each other, you know, in real life at the time. And I think that's also something important to bring out in the scripts that these people, you know, these aren't, these people are not in a vacuum. Uh, they live their lives amongst other people. And many times that they know, they knew the other people involved in their, you know, field or under the theme, you know, the aspect of that aspect of the theme. And so I think it's really, especially if they did have a conflict, um, you know, every uh, every story has three sides, one side, the other side, and the truth, you know. <laughs> um, so uh, to be able to present those perspectives is really important. Um, now, Reverend William Ellis is another one that captivated me um, as well because he was um, he was a printer in at the mission at the London mission in Tahiti, uh, the British mission there. Um, and then he comes here to Hawaii. He's supposed to go to the Marquesas, uh, gets blown off course, ends up here in Hawaii, ends up spending over two years of his life here in Hawaii um, and really playing a really important role um, with Bible translation, writing the first hymns in Hawaiian, uh, preaching the first uh, one of the first sermons in the Hawaiian language because uh, uh, Hawaiian was so similar to Tahitian. They was able to do that relatively quickly. Um, plus his stories about um, his trip to the volcano in 18, uh, 23, 24 is, uh, is really fascinating. It's quite an extensive account um, in his published works about his trip to the volcano um, during that period. So it was, um, it's an exciting story. Well, if you conglomerate year to year about, um, you know, the various stories and themes, uh, what you get, and, and I'm, 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 I may be imperfect in my understanding here, what you get is the story of um, how the missionaries came here, the traders, the missionaries came here and had um, this, this lovely connection with the Native Hawaiian people uh, who accepted them, who were willing to you know, engage and listen to them. It wasn't perfect, but it was, it was unique in terms of these missionaries and their travels around the world. And Hawaii was a great place for them because they could find uh, they could find some understanding here, some some social connection, and intermarriage, I should add. And 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 the people uh, uh, learned English, they learned religion, uh, and things dramatically changed all within a decade or two. And before you know it, there are libraries and newspapers, and uh, the, the religious conversions in large numbers. And, and it affected the monarchy, and the monarchy became global and worldly. Um, and it built the state from very, very little, from a, a primitive civilization, sorry I said that, um, to a modern 19th century, late 19th century civilization that was capable of understanding things uh, around the world. Uh, from a monarchy that, you know, that didn't have any idea what was going on, to a monarchy that knew everything that was going on. Uh, it was the 
um, I don't want to say the Americanization of Hawaii, but it certainly it was the, mm, the development of an advanced society in Hawaii, uh, all within less than 100 years. How, how right am I? How wrong am I in that mm -hmm. analysis? Well, I mean, I, I mean, um, Hawaiian certainly had a sophisticated culture and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, agriculture and aquaculture systems and uh, it had their own, you know, societal and governmental structures. But the, the Hawaiian kingdom faced new challenges in, in beginning in the early 19th, late 18th and early 19th centuries. Uh, they faced new challenges of how to deal with other powers, um, other countries, how to deal with them. Um, in a way that's constructive and helpful to yourself um, and your country. Uh, and I think that's something that the monarchy and that Hawaiians in general, and certainly uh, the ones that the uh, monarchs sent out as diplomats and, and, and ambassadors, um, certainly picked up very quickly and certainly made that adjustment pretty quickly um, to the point where, yeah, in the 1850s and 60s, there's consulates all over the world. Um, you know, of course, King Kalakaua takes his around the world trip. Um, he sends envoys to the, to the you know, uh, Queen Victoria's Jubilee, to the crowning of the King of Serbia and the, and the Russian Tsar, and, you know, and are, you know, negotiating immigration and trade agreements and things like that. And that's um, as a result of, you know, the, the, like I said, the challenges they had to meet to maintain their independence, uh, their sovereignty, and also to navigate this wider world around them. And uh, they, they certainly uh, did an amazing job with that. And uh, certainly some of that can be chalked up to the, um, to, the in, to the instruction of the missionaries and the help that the elite requested of the missionaries. Um, and, but a lot of it is the elite themselves, you know, learning themselves and learning how to deal with all of this and making some, um, some really hard decisions in the 19th century about how to change government structures and change cultural norms and change um, what, how Hawaiians present themselves to the world. Yeah, what, a, what an interesting time. As so many things were happening all at the same time, and you portray that, and these actors portray that, and there's a sort of a common denominator of, um, of improvement, of uh, optimism, uh, of um, you know, a, a connection with international matters. And so it's, uh, by and large, uh, a very positive time and a positive experience. Of course, there were problems, too. There was disease. Um, there were, you know, of course, if you have any growth and change in a given community, there are always mm, issues. And you cover those things, too. But, you know, what, what, I, um, what I come away with, though, is that you cannot understand Hawaii. It's a good thing, and, unless you understand the 19th century of Hawaii. Uh, it's all around us. It's, it's everywhere. Uh, and that's why this is such a valuable contribution to the public, public awareness and, and the public conversation. Are you think, do you think you're going to run out of gas someday, Mike? Do you think you're going to run <laughs> out of interesting stories? Uh, do you think you're going to run out of public interest? Um, I don't think so. There's, there's no sign of that. I don't, I don't think I'm going to lose interest personally. I'm certainly a mission house is not going to lose interest. And what really has become um, a signature program for us? I mean, we just took this, uh, took three of our actors to Maui for four day for four shows, uh, two in Lahaina and two in Makawao, and we had over over uh, two hundred people attend those programs um, over the course of four days. Um, and I don't think uh, with with Oahu Cemetery, our wonderful partners at Oahu Cemetery, um, and the fact that you know that cemetery dates back to eighteen forty four. Um, and I don't, I don't think there's a chance of running out of stories, um, or people to portray, um, even some of the ones that we've done several times, you always, uh, focus on some different aspect of their lives. Uh, for example, in this year's show, we had John Papa E. I I think this is the fifth script we've gotten out of his life. Um, and you know, this time we focused on his learning literacy early and his Bible translation work with, uh, Reverend Bingham. Uh, which is something we had not touched upon in depth um, in pre in the four previous scripts that we did of John Poppy. Um, it was also really interesting to portray him as a young man. Uh, we've generally portrayed him as an older man, uh, kind of looking back on his life. Um, this one is a younger man, sort of going through the experience as he's telling you about it. 
there's a lot of connection with the Iolani Palace, isn't there? Some of your your characters are there in the Iolani Palace and commemorated mm -hmm. there. You know, I remember one uh, one really interesting story and an actor uh, a couple of years ago. It was a, a young woman who portrayed a nurse mm. uh, in the late, I guess, the late 19th century. And there were a lot of medical issues, uh, including, you know, infectious diseases in Hawaii mm. in the 19th century, um, brought by the Howleys and all that. Um, but um, she was, she really opened my eyes as to why the monarchy, why the state, the territory felt um, that public health was so important. And she was, this was a very fine career she was engaged in. She mm -hmm. loved helping people. You remember that one? I'm sure you do. Um, so I believe you're talking about Mabel Smythe, uh, who's considered the sort of Florence Nightingale of Hawaii. She did a lot of work with uh, Palama Settlement. Um, especially mm -hmm. in the aftermath of the Chinatown fires, you yes. know, uh, during the bubonic plague outbreak at that period. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, um, she's, I mean, Sienna Axon was a wonderful actress, um, but her story is, again, something that, you know, um, Palama Settlement was kind of founded in the tradition of like Hull House or some of the other more famous settlement houses that, you know, worked with um, disadvantaged populations and in and, and, and public health. And uh, I mean, her story is just so amazing. And again, something that's relatively undertold. We all go drive past Palama Settlement on, on Vineyard there um, and don't give it two thoughts. But it was a really important place in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. There are so many stories like that. We could spend hours going through some of the incredible uh, characters that you have researched and portrayed. But I, you know, I want to ask you this. You know, there was a movie, George Clooney was in a movie called The Descendants. Mm -hmm. And it was a it was a Hawaii story. And my recollection, my reaction to that movie was that why did Hollywood have to do that? We know more about the, the rule against perpetuities and and the, the hidden valleys in Kauai, um, you know, than they do. And there are, as, as as you know, there are dozens, hundreds, hundreds over 11 years, hundreds of stories that are so captivating about what happened in Hawaii. Uh, leading up to the overthrow, maybe after the overthrow, um, and and we we need to we need to commemorate that. We need to memorialize that. And I wonder if you see, you know, you you're close to um, the research and the script writing and and the and the performance and production. Uh, you and you and Will Howe. Um, I'm I'm wondering if there's going to come a time when we we put all this into a movie. Uh, the likes of which the world has never really seen in terms of its accuracy and, and its uh, import for the state and for anyone looking for lessons from the state. Uh, what do you think? Have you talked about that? Will you talk about that? Well, I mean, there are several um, theater companies and uh, uh, folks involved in the movie industry who are doing exactly that. Um, people like Moses Goods and Tai Sanga and, and some of the others who have done uh, released independent films. Um, or, or have acted in them um, that are telling those stories and, and from a native Hawaiian perspective. And I think uh, that's something that's only gonna grow. Um, you know, I mean, Hollywood has its place, especially in terms of uh, reach and exposure and, and sort of getting those, you know, some of the basics of those stories out. Um, but I think that there's a, a wonderful film community here in Hawaii and that are very talented and very eager to tell our stories ourselves. And I, I hope that they get, uh, they find more success and find more uh, reach than they have have so far. Yeah, I hope they do. I hope they do because it's it's a it's a ripe pom pomegranate is what it is, and there's so much material there, and it's of such great interest not only locally but everywhere because Hawaii is so well known and so unique um, that we really need to do that over time. And I hope I hope that, that happens. So um, going going forward, um, do you think you'll be doing um, neighbor island trips like this and and getting the word out to other communities uh, outside of Oahu? Uh, yeah, we certainly do. We do have uh, we we've started uh, re video recording these performances uh, so that schools and other community organizations kind of rent the video um, and do a Q and A session just like we do at Oahu Cemetery with me um, over something like Zoom, like we are today. Um, we also uh, have done neighbor island trips since 2018. 
Um, so we did, we always go to Maui twice. We go to Maui twice a year. Um, in 2019, we did went to Hawaii Island. We went to Kauai and Maui. Uh, in 2019, we even did a month long tour of New England um, with uh, with uh, uh, my name is Opuka Haia about the story of Henry Opuka Haia <laughs> and his time. And so we did a month long tour in New England uh, with our theater and cultural program there. Um, so hopefully. Uh, in a post COVID world that's so reliant on virtual technology, hopefully our reach will only expand. Don't you go to Yale where um, all these missionaries came from? You know, it was interesting. I was in Yale a couple of weeks ago and I kept mm -hmm. thinking of you, <laughs> <laughs> of, all these, of all these missionaries because uh, Yale right. is so dedicated to missionaries. And why did they, why were they so fascinated with Hawaii? Why did they contribute all these missionaries? Um, really, they. Uh, it's really because of Opukahaia and his story, and the you know he did speaking tours and and you know uh, you know wrote letters and told people about Hawaii. Uh, before Opukahaia, uh, some of the missionaries that came in that first company in 1820 were slated to be going elsewhere, like places like Sri Lanka, uh, for example. Um, so it's really Opukahaia and his life story and his. Um, the way he approached wanting to bring it, bring Christianity to the island, um, that really brought folks here. Without Apukahaia, these missionaries certainly wouldn't have come when they did, um, if they would, if they came at all. Uh, you know, that that what that's very very interesting in in a, in a historical sense, which I'm sure you appreciate. Sometimes one person, just one person, with a creative idea, changes the course of history, and and uh, with him, of course, out of Yale. But also, um, you know, within Hawaii, in, in the characters that you memorialize, some of those people had a huge effect on the history that followed. They changed the world, uh, if not locally, then globally. And, and I find that always an interesting study about history, and, and certainly here, because you can track it back. And, you know, your performances in the cemetery help us track back some of the cultural and institutional of development points of Hawaii to one person, and that's mm -hmm. fabulous. <laughs> well, let me let me ask let me ask you this: uh, the Q and A part, which I, as you know, I always enjoy and always ask you questions. Mm -hmm. um, you learn a lot about who is there, about who comes, who attends the programs, and their level of interest, and so forth. Uh, and and you can tell a lot from what happens in the Q and A. So, query: Who is coming? Who are the people who are in the room? Who are the people who sign up and attend and 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 have the the dinner and, and attend the theater? Right. So I'd probably say ninety to ninety five percent of our audience are local um, here. Um, we even get descendants of some of the people we portray uh, in the audience. That happens relatively frequently. Um, and then uh, we do get a, a. Sometimes we get the occasional visitor as well. Um, I'm not sure if you were there that night, Jay, but we had a couple from Washington, D.C. Um, that came to I was our there. cemetery. I was there. Theater. Yeah. Um, and they, they kind of heard about it. They saw it on a website and they went, well, this looks different. Uh, <laughs> let's do that. And so um, and they they learned, you know, as much, if not more than any, than everyone else as well. Right. Um, and that's the again, the unique part about being able to focus on individual people. Yeah, it is totally unique. So, um, what would you like? Uh, I I know that you're usually maxed out on on you know on tickets for this, mm -hmm. but uh, to the extent that somebody wants to sign up now or later here or Neighbor Island, uh, how do they find you? Where where do they go? Where do they look? The best thing to do is to go to missionhouses.org, uh, the Mission Houses website, and look at our events page. Uh, we do Cemetery Poo Poo Theater every June, uh, the last three weekends in June. Um, the other thing you could do is to get on our, our email newsletter list. Um, and so you can email info at missionhouses.org and get our mailing list to find out about all the other different things that we do as well. And suppose they had an idea for a theme. Suppose they are related to somebody in the cemetery. Suppose they would like you to celebrate mm, their relative. Um, uh, how can they make them themselves known to you? Uh, many times they'll come up to me themselves and say, you know, I'm related to so-and-so. 
um, who's right over here. Uh, he has a really fat, he or she has a really fascinating story. Um, and it all depends upon the themes we choose every year. Um, I have taken some of those suggestions before. Uh, and when the theme came up, I went, hey, there was that one guy who told me about so-and-so and let's go find them in the cemetery and see if this will work. Um, so we have certainly done that before. I get lots of people who ask, can you do my relative next? Um, it, it's just all, it all depends upon the theme we want to focus on for the year. Um, and there's certainly people where I go, oh, I, yeah, I'm familiar with that person's, you know, kind of basic story and, and life and history. And yeah, that would be super interesting. Uh, but it all depends on how we package the whole show together. Well, Mike, what, what message, if any, would you like to leave with our audience today? Uh, what would you have them think about uh, going forward? Well, I mean, there's an um, old Hawaiian proverb about uh, in order to move forward, you need to look back. And um, I think this program allows you to do that. Um, and also think about how we can move forward together and how we can move forward constructively as a society and as individual people as well. And um, always take time to learn about the place you're in. Absolutely. And uh, you know, I've been to a number of uh, the productions, and I must say that I learned so much and it connect me so much. And uh, it, it's a unique experience. And I will continue to do that forever. Uh, and I think there are a lot of people in the same boat. Anyway, thank you very much for, for organizing this, for doing it, the research and the, the choices you make. It's a, a tremendous contribution uh, to the public conversation about Hawaii history. And, and uh, what will I say? Thank you for your service, Mike. Oh, thank you. And thanks for having me here today, Jay. It's a pleasure to be on Think Tech. Aloha. Here at the Hawaiian Mission Houses Historic Site and Archives, we are honored to be stewards of this historic space and to create programming that fosters community engagement and discussion of a rich history from multiple perspectives, which impacts us all today. The Hawaiian Mission Houses Historic Site and Archives was founded in 1820 by Protestant missionaries from New England as the Sandwich Islands Mission. Today, we are a national historic landmark and accredited by the American Alliance of Museums. Thousands of visitors are hosted each year with engaging programs, significant archival collections, and site tours. History Theater is our signature and award-winning program which presents an intimate look at Hawaii's history through historical portrayals of people who have impacted our community. I belong to the first generation of Hawaiians to learn the palapala, how to read and write. Through the palapala, we were able to share our thoughts and ideas swiftly between districts across islands from Hawaii to America to England. As the ship's sails filled, I felt a chill despite the warm kiss of the Hawaiian sun above. It was not uncommon for us to be apart for a few months at a time, but this seemed different. It was the last time I looked on my husband's face. On Friday, May 13th, 1853, a Kanaka came trembling to Marshall Park's office. He brought with him grave news. Two Hawaiians were sick with eruptions on their skin at Mauna Kea Street. Excellent. You played the perfect pupils. I felt my missionary years come rushing back. <laughs> my name is Betsy Stockton, and I spent 40 years of my life as a teacher and a servant of Christ, educating both children and adults. Me, a colored woman, a former slave, Never Join did. me in a toast to the health of Kamehameha III and an independent Hawaii.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.